See, we're under the see we're the, we're under the microscope whether we know it each and every day. You know how our light shines and how the world sees us each and every day. And I was out on the job, and this guy that I debate with each and every day, he looked at me, and he said one first question he asked me. He says, "Why do you carry that Bible everywhere you go?" That's what he said to me. So that's one question I'm going to touch base on tonight. The second question he asked me. He said, why does that Bible mean so much to you? That's the second question he asked me. And the third question he asked me, he said, see that Bible you're carrying there? He said, that thing's over 2,000 years old. There is no way that thing pertains to the way we're living now. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try my best to answer those three questions. I'm going to preach the sermon to you all tonight. Plus, I'm going to, what I've studied out and everything to him, I'm I'm going to take to him. So I hope you all enjoy it tonight. I know this is extra time and everything like this. So the first question he asked me, he said, when he asked me that, he said, why do you carry this Bible everywhere you go? I picked up my Bible. I looked at him. I said, your word, the word, your word is a lamp for my feet and a light to my path. That's what came to my mind. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I'm just so thankful Thankful to be here tonight among the assembly. So thankful that we have another opportunity to study out your word and just think about it because it is your word that, that guides our life each and every day. It's, it's the word that you left, and even though it was wrote over 2,000 years ago through many authors, over 40 of them, Lord, they're still as strong as they was the day they was put on paper and distributed out to all of us through the Holy Spirit. And I'm thankful for that, Lord. And Lord, I pray to you tonight, I pray that uh, you just give me to, the courage to speak boldly and stand strong in your word, that everything that I studied out may touch someone's heart here tonight. Because that's, that's an example we, we should be living to guide the lost, proclaim the good news, and see that someone comes to Christ through it. So thankful for your son Jesus and the hope that we have through him. So thankful that he went to the cross for, for me, for my sins. It's in his name that we pray all these things. Amen. See that's what I see that's what I come back with him, to him before I before I gave him my answer. I said, Your word is a is a lamp for for my feet and a light to my path. Question one is that he asked me, he says, he said, Why do you carry that Bible wherever you go? See, us as Christians, it's our sword. We we read it in Ephesians six, where Paul talks about the full, full armor of God. See, in Ephesians 6, 17, it helps us defend ourselves. So we put all on, on all the armor of God each time we go out. It also, in 1 Peter 3, 15, we should always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope you have. See, that's why we carry this Bible around. There's, there's, there's going to be times in our life that we're going to be asked to give an answer for the hope we have in that's Jesus Christ. That's simple. But as that verse goes on, we need to do it with gentle, gentleness and respect. We need to speak the word in truth and love. That's why I carry my Bible around with me to give an answer for the hope that, that I have in Jesus Christ. Second, the second reason I carry my Bible wherever I go is in 2 Timothy 3.16 that I know that all God... All Scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that a servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. See, this word that we look here tonight and we're studying out through and using Scripture on, it's to train us in the way we should go, the things that we should do. It's also used to rebuke. Rebuke things that are not true. Rebuke, correct people when they're falsely speaking not using God's Word. See, if we don't have this thing with us, we can't do that. I mean, we all don't have the memory that Aaron has. I mean, that's a God-given talent. And he uses it well. Also, the reason I carry my Bible everywhere I go is in 2 Timothy 2.15. It's to do yourself... Sorry. 
To do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, and who, cor who correctly handles the truth of God. See, I told you, everybody's watching you. They're looking at you. Every move you make, everything you do, just like this, like this guy was doing to me. And it's our duty to do the best we can. The best we can. That's what it says in the Scripture. To present ourselves as God, to God, yourself to God as one approved. A worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. See, those should be goals. I see Phil underline his Bible right now. That should be a verse that we go to every day. To be one of God approved. The second question that he asked me is, why does this Bible mean so much to you? See, right now, I don't know if everybody's got their Bible open. I'm, I'm going to ask you to pick up your Bible. There's one sitting in, in your pews and everything like that. Turn to the contents of your Bible. As we can see, there's 66 books there. And through the Old Testament and through the New Testament. If the world picked up this book and read it, like him, it would seem dysfunctional. But we know as Christians, this Bible is not dysfunctional. This Bible is in unity and in harmony with the truth of, of God. It seems dysfunctional to the world, but it brings unity to, us, unity to us. It's in complete harmony of one story, the story of Jesus Christ, before and after. In the Old Testament, it's the coming of Christ. The New Testament is He's here. Messiah has come. It's God building a nation in the Old Testament. See, when we read this book, we can recall the stories of Adam and Eve, Abraham, King David, Daniel, Peter, John, and of course, the Apostle Paul. See, in reading the story of Job, it's a story of suffering. In reading the book of Psalms, see, we see how to pray. See, in reading the book of Proverbs, it shows us how to live. See, in reading the book of Ecclesiastics, it shows us how to enjoy life. See, in reading the four Gospels, Matthew, Luke, John, sorry, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it's a story of our Savior, Jesus Christ. His walk here on, on the earth. It's in John 1.14, the Word become flesh and made its dwelling among us. See, we also read in the four Gospels the death, the burial, and the resurrection of our Savior. It's our hope. It's what gives us meaning in our life. See, it's in Acts 2, on the day of Pentecost, the church is established and Peter preaches the first sermon. So that's what the Bible means to me. Uh-oh. Computers. It's my hope. And I hope it's your hope. It's all of our hope. This Bible is. That's what it should mean to you. See, it's our lamp that we carry. And it's also the light that guides our path. See, if the Bible means anything to us, we should read it. We should apply it and we should live it out. Question three that was asked says, this book is so old, how can I apply it to today's times? <coughs> See, we can. You know, I'm I may not bring out some of the things that you would just come off the top of your head that 
how we can apply it for, and I'm sure that you have different more different things. But this Bible to me, how I would apply it today's time is. See, the book of Job shows us, I said earlier, it shows us how to suffer. See, and let me get back to where I'm at. See, we live in a culture and a world in a world nowadays that it's all about me and it's not about God. See, it's a fairy tale life. See, everybody thinks everything's good and perfect. Everything ain't a plate of gold. See, we just, see, Job was a good man. He says it in Job one. He says, "In the land of Uz, there lived a man who was named Job, whose name was Job. This man was blameless and upright." And he feared God and he shunned evil. So that should be an example for all of us. Each and every one of us here tonight. But Job suffered. God tested Job. He tested his faith. He told the devil. He said, you can have anything to do, but don't touch Job. Life is, life is about suffering. It's about, you know, when all things are against you, you're doing the right thing. See, we can look at Job's life and see that he had everything. He had seven sons, three daughters, 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yokes of oxen, 500 donkeys, and a large number of servants. And God te tested Job. He took it all. And Job, once he was tested... He stood on his knees. He laid down his knees and he worshiped God. In all this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing for what he had to suffer. See, Job lived out the plan that God had for him in his suffering. See, we're not willing to do that. In the story through Job, many times we complain when he didn't complain. He didn't sin. He didn't do anything wrong. He stood the plan. He stood the course of time. And it said in Job 14, the Lord restored his fortunes and gave him twice as much as he had before. See, it was all tucken from Job. But because he, he suffered and endured the test, he got it all back and he got twice more. See, it's about doing God's work. Let's look at Solomon's life. See, he reigned, he reigned for 40 years. He was king. And in that time, he spent 20 years building God's temple and his palace. The next 20 years, he spent sinning and displeasing God. See, what I see in this story is See, if we take our eyes off God's plan and God's work, we will fail. And that was the problem with Solomon. He took his eyes off what God wanted him to really do. See, I'm sure King David wanted his son, his son Solomon, to be just like him. Just like our dads want us to be just like him. Like them. Sorry about that. You know, I'm sure King David wanted Solomon to be a man of after own, a man after God's own heart, just like it says in 1 Samuel 13, 14. See, action and action and worth ethic is the key to life. Doing God's work, having the heart and desire. It boils down to how what kind of heart we have to do his plan and live it out. See, even the people in in the book of Acts, in Acts 2, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship and to the breaking of bread, the breaking of bread and prayer. See, they they put their they done God's work. That's just like we should be doing this evening. See, if we do that, we gotta understand, as it says in Acts 2, 47. 
and the Lord added to their number daily, daily who was being saved. See, it's our, it's our obligation to proclaim the good news. See, if we fail at that, we'll never succeed in God's plan. See, I talked about David. David, I mean Solomon wanted, wanted to be like his father. He should have wanted to be like his father. And he may have been. I may say something out of wrong. But as we see in Ephesians 6, verses 2 and 3, God commands us to honor our fathers and mothers. See, we don't think this Bible applies to us, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that we may go, we may go well with you and that you may enjoy a long life here on earth. So we don't think the Bible pertains to us. It's written over 2,000 years ago. Here's a place where we failed, I think, in society. There's no honor in, honoring the father and mother anymore. Jake preached on it this morning. He touched on the same verse. See, we, we live in a world that does the opposite of this. We have parents now raising their grandkids. Pushing, push, we have kids pushing their kids off on their grandparents to raise. See, there's no honor in that. There's no honor in, in, in doing that. See, we as parents have failed. Failed ourselves. Also, we have kids now that are leaning on their parents' income. Calling them on the phone and saying, hey, instead of working it out and pushing themselves to be the best they can be, they're calling their parents to pay their bills or do the things they need to do. So there's nothing in this, in this verse or anything that I said that a parent is honoring their parents in this. See, we live in a society now that says that's okay. To be okay with that. But this Bible was written 2,000 years ago and it don't, it, don't, it don't apply to the world that we live in today. It also says in this Ephesians 6, 1 that children are to obey their parents in the Lord, for this is right. See, we have a discipline problem in this world. This Bible was written over 2,000 years ago and it still don't apply. See, not us as parents to obey the children. I just said that. We got it reversed. See, see, I'm a father. This verse applies to me. It says, fathers, in Ephesians 6, 4, fathers do not Aspirate your children. Instead, bring them up in training and instruction of the Lord. Do you know what the meaning of aspiration means in that verse? Huh? No. It means... No. I looked it up, so you all might have a different thing than I have. It says, don't let them hang out with the wrong crowd. See, we're all... We're all doing that. I'm a parent that does that each and every time. These statistics that I give you right now will blow your mind, what I'm getting ready to say here, about where there's no discipline. Especially in our school system. When you, read, when you hear this statistic, it'll, it, it will really it'll take heart. You know, from middle school to high school right now, 21% of the kids in America are not going to the bathroom during the day, during the day, because they're afraid of being bullied. Twenty-one percent of kids in America now day are afraid to go to the bathroom during the day. They will not go to the bathroom because they're scared to do that. This statistic, statistic, I can't hardly believe. But forty percent of girls in middle school. In high school, right now, will have a baby before the age of 19. For, that's, that's over half the kids in America in school right now, in middle school. 40% of the girls will have a baby before the age of 19. And where do we go wrong? No yeah. That's what I'm saying. I just read those verses from Ephesians. Six. 
The divorce rate in America is now at 60% in marriages. So everybody that's getting married, 60% of them will be divorced. I've done this and I talked about it in my Sunday school class a while back and somebody asked me, he said, check the statistics of Christians. And I did. 38% of Christians that attend regularly on Sundays are getting divorced now. And it's all because it goes back to not honoring the father and mother, not doing the things that we are supposed to do to train our children up right, getting them on the right track. That's why these statistics are so, so uh, astonishing to me. See, it don't apply to now, today's times, according to people. The question I was asked, this book don't apply. It's written over 2,000 years ago. We're not living it out. We're not being that light we're called to be. And I, talk, and I talked about divorce there just earlier. First time divorce, 60%. Among Christians, it's 38%. And the Bible specifically says in Ephesians 6, verses 22 through 24, Wives, submit yourself to your own husband as you do, as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so the wife should submit to their husband in everything they do. Think about that. That verses. And I'm not going to get into in, in different things but like that. But I'm asking women here to believe in their husbands. That's cementing in them. Know that he is the leader of the house. Do the things that he asked you to do. do. Be the person you asked him to do. You know, it's us guys that need confidence. And we're not the confidence people in the world. I know I'm not. Without my wife, I, I would be nothing. Ephesians 6, verse 25 through 31, it says, Husbands, love your wives as, as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing, cleansing her by the washing of water through the word, and present her to himself as a radiant church, without stain, without wrinkle, any other blemish, but with holiness and blameless. In the same ways, husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body just as Christ does the church. For we are all members of his body. For this reason, a man leaves his father and mother and will be united with it to his wife as two become one. See, I know each and every guy here loves their body and they take care of it. They do the things that they're supposed to do. And see, when I talked earlier about myself, and I said I'm worried about myself, I know my wife believes in me and is there to nurse me and do the things that she's supposed to do just like I'm supposed to do for her. See, when it comes all down to it, when we talk about this love relationship between a husband and a wife, I firmly believe unless your spouse is deceased, there's two people that's going to be there with you in your last moments. And that's God and your wife holding your hand. The ones that have one and the ones that have husbands here. You're going to need her. You're going to need her to lean on. She's going to need you and you're going to need her to lean on. See, me, me and Kim, and I by no means mean to boast, me and Kim have been married for 16 years. And I'm not boasting. We're, we're still looking for things to do to make our relationship exciting. We're still trying to do, do these certain things. I think I mentioned it a few weeks ago. We're still trying things. We're still trying to make that love show and stand like it should. See, I'll just give you a hint of one thing that I may have mentioned it to some of you. Kim done something that I enjoy very well to do that she don't like to do. But because she loves me, she done it. I done something that she loves to do that I don't like. See, we've got to step outside of our box if we want to have that perfect relationship. If we want to bring these 
statistics down. See, I stand before you tonight. You know, I'm a divorced person. I, I'm in those statistics, you know. That's why I work so hard on my marriage. And that's why I encourage you all to work hard on your marriage. See, in finishing, the message ain't changed. As we give invitation tonight, you know, it's our duty to be the light. Be the light we're called to give Him the glory. That's what it says in Matthew 5.16. Be the light. Jesus is the light. We're to follow every example that He set. See, if we're going to come to Christ and people's going, we're going to lead people to Christ, we're going to have to love one another, we're going to have to set the examples, and we're going to have to do what this Bible says. That's what it is. Proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of our Savior. See, I hope this sermon made sense to you tonight. So this is some things that, that were on my mind and that I'll have to discuss with this person eventually when we cross paths again. You know, ask yourself those questions. I hope many of you can carry your Bible wherever you go. And I hope this, this book means just as much to you as it does to me. And I hope that when you ever called to give an answer for this book and somebody says, there's no way this thing can pertain to my life and how I should live. See, Christian, this is all we got. This is what God gave us. We should be focusing on it every, every day. There's no way, there's no way that you can ever have a relationship with God if you don't invest time in this book right here. You'll never be the Christian you're called to be if you don't invest time in this book. I promise you that.